Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying our legal education content, please remember to subscribe, it helps the channel grow. For today's case, we're dealing with the issue of sex discrimination in employment, and perhaps even more importantly, an issue of sex discrimination when it comes to the judge who is hearing the case. This is the case of Audrey Miller versus Sam Houston State University of Texas. In this case, uh, Ms. Miller was fired and let go by one university, not hired by another university uh, because of sex discrimination, or so it's alleged. And the trial court themselves also engaged in behavior that suggests maybe the trial court was biased and not looking at this in the most fair way. So we're going to read a little bit about the case of Ms. Miller, what she did or did not experience, what the trial court did or did not do, and what it means for the future. Let's get started with this. Miller joined the Sam Houston University as a tenure-track assistant professor of psychology in the university's clinical psychology doctoral program in the Department of Psychology and Philosophy in August of 2007. In this position, Miller supervised students in a clinic doc program, taught practical courses, and served on student dissertation and thesis committees. According to the university, Miller was lacking in collaborative and attentive generosity towards her colleagues. So according to the university, maybe he doesn't play so well with fellow uh, faculty members, I guess. She complained about a heavy workload, which she believed to be disproportionate compared to those of her fellow colleagues. Miller also disagreed with other members of the faculty while serving on dissertation and thesis committees. She is removed from one committee due to inflexibility and voluntarily offered to step down from another due to conflicts with other committee members. Miller contends these disagreements were retaliatory because of sex and the complaints that she raised throughout her clinical workload. So we have a basic employment discrimination thesis or uh, pattern here, right? So we have a tale of two stories. Uh, there's a person who's working as a, a, a faculty member um, who's engaged in certain things. She says, oh, my workload's too high. The university says that she doesn't work well with others. She claims sex discrimination. They, they claim that she's not a, an efficient worker and doesn't play well as a team. So it's a pretty typical run-of-the-mill pattern. And we have to figure out what's true and what's not. It's hard to tell from its face, but this is pretty par for the course. All right, so what happens next to make it a little bit less par for the course? Despite these issues, Miller applied for tenure at the university in 2012, but the reviewers recommended that the tenure and promotion be denied due to lack of collegiality or playing nice with others or sexism or whatever. The university informed Miller of his decision to deny the tenure in March of 2013. There and after, Miller filed charges of sex discrimination and retaliation with the EEOC and the Texas Workforce Commission. So again, very sort of standard, run-of-the-mill fact pattern. We have a tale of two stories. You discriminate against because of sex. No, we discriminated against you because you don't work nicely with others. So we have to go and figure out what's true. All right, what's next? After learning of the tenure track denial at the, South, at the Sam Houston University, Miller applied for one of open faculty positions at another university. So she says, okay, I'd like to move on to a different school. How'd that go? Following the interview that she did, the committee for the other university rated her as a second highest candidate for the position. And there were three open positions. So if she's second highest, then presumably she'd get one of the three that's open, right? Okay. On April the 7th, the department chair sent an email to the search committee. Later that day, there was a call to inquire into the decision to deny the tenure track and promotion. What was said during the phone call is nowhere on the record. But after the department's call with the other department, the university reversed courts from the recommendation and decide not to offer employment. So yeah, as, as you would expect and would not be completely atypical, the one university contacts the other university to find out how she is a worker. Now, most universities, and for that matter, most employers will basically only confirm dates of employment. It's like, yes, and they'll confirm under the circumstances in which they left. That's about it for exactly this reason. We don't want to get into discrimination cases. So the one university calls the other university and says, okay, can you tell us about this person? And apparently there was a conversation which is unrecorded. But as a result of that conversation, the university decided not to hire this person for one of three positions, even though she was second rated. So perhaps the uh, 
conversation might have related to a little bit of uh, what happened and perhaps unfairly prejudiced her, or so the allegation goes. In the end, the second university filled all three open positions with candidates who scored lower on the higher metrics than Miller. According to Dean Fulton, the decision to hire Miller was based entirely on concerns regarding Miller's teaching and services due to her tenure denial at the other university. So it wasn't because of anything we found independently. It was all because of the mean, mean things that other universities said. So that could be like a defamation. That could be a whole, false character. That could be a whole bunch of things. The dean further stated that she was never made aware that Miller had filed charges of discrimination or other complaints against the university with ed other federal or state authorities. Miller later filed complaints against the university who didn't hire her with the EEOC. So they're saying, okay, you're also now engaged in sex discrimination, which is why most lawyers would just say, just confirm the dates, and that's about it. But they decided to go into more details, and now they're on the hook too. This is why most universities would say, don't do this. So that looks to the various universities and how they get involved in this story. But of course, there is the perhaps more interesting story of how the trial judge gets involved and what biases they or they may not have. So what did the trial judge do and what might it say about potential fairness to the relevant parties in judging this matter? Let's read on. The trial judge made remarks that signaled a predisposition against Miller's claims. When Miller requested additional discovery, including the opportunity to take depositions, the district judge denied the request, noting that the request was too argumentative and extensive. I'd like to interview, I'd like to depose the people that were involved. No, 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 you can't do that. That's too argumentative. Hmm. Finally, as, an initial, as the initial conference ended, the judge asked the parties if the cases should be consolidated. So there were two different universities she's suing. And they're over a similar case. So consolidation isn't necessarily the worst idea I've ever heard of. And maybe that's a perfectly proper thing. Maybe we should consolidate them. That seems like a reasonable question. But contrary to the judge's apparent preference, the parties unanimously requested that the court keep the cases separate. So consolidation isn't the worst idea. It's reasonable. But all the parties said, no, we don't want to consolidate. We want to keep them separate. Okay. The district judge replied to Miller's counsel, all right, I will get credit for closing two cases when I crush you. Miller's counsel attempted to respond, but the judge interjected, how will that look on your record? Okay, so this is, again, at an initial conference. It's relatively early in the case, which is a good time to consider consolidation. We have two different universities, so there's some divergence, but it's a common plaintiff. It's a common cause of action. The second university might have done so because of what the first university did. So a lot of things are in common. So consolidation might make sense. It's a perfectly reasonable thing. And even if both parties say no, trial management is within the discretion of the judge. So the judge could even say, despite both parties saying no, well, let's consolidate anyway because these issues in the name of judicial efficiency, let's consolidate them. Of course, the judge saying no, even when all the parties say no, yes, or the other way around, is a bit problematic. But even more problematic is where the judge says, okay, if you don't want to consolidate, I'll get credit for crushing your case when I crush two of them. And then when one of the lawyers said, wait a second, when the one lawyer started to speak, presumably to say, um, you know, that, that suggests a little bit bias, the, the judge didn't let them speak and said, how will it look on your record when you start talking and objecting to the fact that I've already decided, again, at an initial conference, so we're pretty early in the case, that, ah, I'm going to crush both these cases. Maybe not the fairest judge we've ever heard of of our lives. The district court held a pretrial conference in May of 2016. There, the parties discussed the limited discovery that had been exchanged up to this point. The district court asked the university's counsel if he had taken Miller's deposition and then permitted counsel to notice the deposition. Miller's counsel then asked, may we take a deposition as well? And the trial judge said, no. Okay, so the district judge asked the university if they'd taken Miller's deposition, and then he permitted counsel to notice the deposition, which is saying, let's schedule it. So then Miller's counsel says, can we take depositions as well? And the judge says, no. All right, so... The university would like to depose Miller, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. 
Miller is the plaintiff of this case. She's obviously a material witness. What she does and does not know and what she did or did not experience. She's obviously a perfectly valid person to depose for the university. And the 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 court says, hey, have you have you deposed them? And presumably the answer was no. So the court said, okay, I'm taking notice that you're going to do this at some point in the future. And so then Miller says, hey, if they can do some depositions, maybe we'd also like to do some depositions. Maybe we'd like to maybe we'd like to depose the university or the dean or the people that were involved in this phone call, for example. They might be proper people. It's like, can we depose them? And the court says, no. Seems, uh, seems again, maybe a little bit biased towards Miller. Maybe not the most objective decisions we ever heard of. The two universities deposed Miller on the 25th of May, while Miller's motions for depositions apparently remain pending. The district court actually attended parts of the deposition and participated. Okay, that's, that's super weird. That's super weird. It is really, really weird for a judge to participate in a deposition. I've, I've never heard of it happening, let alone experienced it myself. Normally, a deposition just involves the parties. And if the, the parties will threaten to call a judge. I've, I've never actually even heard of a judge participating in a deposition. It's at least theoretically possible. But for the judge to participate in a deposition, that seems really, really weird. Really weird. So how did the judge participate in this deposition? Hmm. Well, at one point, the judge apparently admonished Miller, who is a witness at the time. The court. If you're unhappy with the rulings I've made about discovery, that's fine. Free country. This is not the place to discuss your feelings. It is a place to answer the opposing counsel's questions. You have sued his client, their, their client's people, and they have the right to know exactly why. Which is true as far as it goes. But, you know, maybe both ways. Later, apparently, the judge also offered the following comments. Ma'am, you're not to lecture the state of Texas on law. Your counsel and I will do that. It's not important to your case what you think about nine-year-old people on the Potomac River talk about something. We're here to find out what you actually know about the facts, so please do not burn the record with this side trip. Hmm. Doesn't, doesn't necessarily seem very fair. On appeal, Miller raises the following issues. Whether the district court erred by dismissing claims against the universities, whether the district court erred by denying the motion for reconsideration of the ruling, whether the district court abused discretion by denying repeated discovery requests, and whether the cases should have been reassigned on remand. We address each in turn. So it didn't it didn't exactly go well for Miller at the trial stage. She she lost, and she'd like to appeal and say, you know, maybe I didn't really get a fair trial. Let's consider that. A district court may dismiss for failure to state a claim on its own motion as long as the procedure is fair. So take note here, the party didn't even ask to dismiss. The, the university didn't even ask to dismiss. The court just dismissed it on its own. That's another indicator, maybe not fair. So a court can do this, but the fact they did do it, even though the university didn't ask, is a little suspicious. While there is no bright line rule, generally, fairness in this context requires both notice of a court's intention and an opportunity to respond. That would be a good thing. In a prior case, though not presidential, it's analogous to this situation. In that case, a plaintiff sought damages against an insurer for failing to tender coverage payments. The plaintiff later moved to transfer venue, continue the trial, and consolidate with a related. But after considering the motion, the court, on its own initiative, dismissed the claims, finding the plaintiff had no cause of action, even though no one bothered to ask. As in a prior case, we've held on appeal, the district court denied the plaintiffs both notice that it might sui sponte dismiss their case and an opportunity to respond. Even assuming the exchange constituted notice to Miller prior to the system dismissal, the district court failed to give Miller an adequate opportunity to respond to the intention to dismiss. The district court dismissed Miller's claims at an initial case management conference, and memorialized the dismissal in an order entered a day later. The record provides no indication that either party briefed the issue until Miller moved for reconsideration. It's also notable that district court dismissed the university's cases with prejudice, 
so that Miller was not given any opportunity to amend to cure any deficiency that ostensibly warned it. So the judge not only dismissed on their own initiative, but dismissed with prejudice without any opportunity to be heard. It's kind of weird. Dismissing an action after giving the plaintiff only one opportunity to state their claims is ordinarily unjustified. A little bit suspicious, yes. Taking all this into consideration, the district court failed to give Miller an adequate opportunity to respond before it dismissed claims against the universities with prejudice. Accordingly, the court erred in its on its own initiative dismissal for the university's complaints. After dismissal of the rel relevant complaints and denial of the motion for reconsideration, the district court repeatedly denied the request for discovery, including requests to dispose witnesses with knowledge material to the claim. Miller asserts the district court abused discretion in doing so. Based on the review, we agree. We review a district court's discoveries rulings for abuse of discretion. Generally, broad discretion is afforded to the district court when deciding discovery matters. We reverse only if the decision affected a party's substantial rights. Substantial rights are affected if the district court's decision was arbitrary or clearly unreasonable. We have a sense of deja vu. The district court's discovery restrictions in this case are strikingly similar to those of a prior case. And although a district court is customarily afforded a wide discretion in handling discovery, we will not uphold a ruling which has failed to adhere to the spirit of the rules. As in the prior case, a district judge has permitted only Miller's deposition to be taken before the summary judgment and argument, and then actually participated in that deposition, which is super weird. By contrast, the court repeatedly denied Miller the opportunity to dispose, depose any witnesses, relenting only after summary judgment briefing was completed to allow Miller one deposition of the dean. And that deposition was two hours long at most, not very much of a deposition in this case. To put it simply, the court's discovery restrictions suffocated any chance for Miller to present her claims. While universities offer that Miller was not prejudiced because she'd already received voluminous documentation from her pre-suit information request, we are not persuaded, given the district court's inflexible denials of both her written requests and her request to take depositions. Miller requested discovery on multiple occasions and was denied almost instantly at every turn. And then the court goes through the record here of all the times that they requested. January, January the 25th, denied same day. April 13th, denied the next day. May the 4th, denied same day. May the 12th, denied a month and a half later. June the 2nd, denied in the summary judgment on the 30th, 30th of September. Lastly, Miller asked this court to reassign their cases. We find this request warranted. The power to reassign is an extraordinary one and is rarely invoked. Reassignment should be made infrequently and with great reluctance. In determining whether reassignment is proper, this court has applied two tests, one that's more lenient than the others. The more stringent of these tests requires the following. Whether the original judge would reasonably be expected upon her man to have substantial difficulty in putting out of his mind or her mind previously expressed views or findings determined to be erroneous based on evidence that must be rejected, whether, at, whether reassignment is advisable to preserve the appearance of justice and whether reassignment would, would entail waste and duplication out of proportion to any gain in preserving the appearance of fairness. So it's a pretty strict standard and pretty unusual. Will the court find it here? Here, the district judge conduct from the outset of Miller's cases might, at the least, reasonably cause an objective observer to question the impartiality. Moreover, the cumulative weight of both the prejudicial comments and preemptory rulings by the district judge leads us to conclude the original judge would reasonably be expected upon remand to have substantially different difficulty in putting out of his mind of previously expressed views and this reassignment is advisable to preserve justice. Miller, like every litigant, is entitled to a full and fair opportunity to make their case in a fair and impartial forum. Beyond that, the fundamental to judiciary is the public's confidence in the impartiality of judges and proceedings over which they preside. Judges must satisfy the appearance of justice in addition to justice itself. Thus, we reverse the district court's judgments, including its sua sponte dismissal of, of failure to state a claim in favor of the universities and remand for further proceedings. Our remand, we further direct the court to reassign these cases. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case of Audrey Miller versus Sam Houston. In this case, Miss Miller was fired by a university. It might have been sex discrimination, it might not. We don't really know, to be completely fair. The university thinks it's an inability to get along with colleagues. And we can reasonably assume that they have other female uh, participants in the college. So there's 
some suggestion there. And of course, there's some suggestion in the contrary. That's what trials are for. But unfortunately, this particular trial court seemed to have a lot of animus towards Miss Miller and her claims. They, they failed to grant her any discovery. They dismissed causes of action that she brought without anyone bothering to ask, even though both universities and her didn't want to consolidate the cases. They consolidated anyway. Lots of very uh, strange decisions. And the judge, even perhaps most strange of all, the one that's even the most bizarre, is the judge participated in the deposition. That's really, really weird. And then, like, gave comments during the deposition, which is really, really weird. So what is true going on with the universities? Was it sex discrimination? Was it not? I have no idea. And neither do you for that matter. But the judge's behavior, not exactly what we're looking for in justice. So the Court of Appeals reverses all that, says, yeah, no, um, we're reversing all of it. We're reversing the motions to dismiss, and we're going to start over with a new trial judge. So we go back to square one and we try again. But that, for the moment, my friends, is the end of the coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.